Hey, fellow viewer, and welcome back to a new episode of Hammer D20, the show that can find something enjoyable in even the worst of films and something to criticize in the best of films, as any good contrarian internet critic would. My name is Steven Sobot, and I will be your guide. Today, we're going to do a bit of a double feature on two comedy horror films that I had watched recently, or more so one that I'd watched recently and one that I'd say is very comparable. The first being Renfield, the 2023 action horror film starring Nicholas Holt and most notably Nicholas Cage, and the 2014 mockumentary What We Do in the Shadows. I'm choosing these mostly because I had just watched Renfield and I figured it was a good time to do an episode about a new film that had come out. And Renfield was a film that I had watched that was overwhelmingly okay. It was a film that kind of exists. It's kind of funny. It's very gory, almost a little too much sometimes, but I guess it kind of makes sense. But it really kind of pulled its punches, I would say, on the parody of vampire life and vampire society and what we understand of vampires. Whereas What We Do in the Shadows does a great job of imitating a lot of those ideas and making satire or a joke of what we understand of vampirism. So, why did I think Renfield was so mediocre and What We Do in the Shadows is so much better? Well, let's go and talk about it. So, Renfield is a 2023 action horror film, as it's described on Wikipedia, although if you ask me, it's more of an action comedy, uh, starring Nicholas Holt of Mad Max Fury Road and Warm Bodies fame, and some random guy I've never talked about, Nicholas Cage. Who the hell is that guy? Pfft, who knows? It's a film that follows Robert Montague Renfield, the servant, or familiar, of the vampiric lord of darkness, Count Dracula. Renfield's role is to assist Dracula in his duties by being his daytime conduit, by bringing him victims to feast on, and by protecting him and finding him lairs to live in. While Dracula has overwhelming amounts of power, Renfield has a portion of his power which, instead of eating humans, he eats insects to trigger his power. It still does give him superhuman abilities and healing, being able to jump hundreds of feet in the air and punch men's heads clean off their bodies. That all being said, this conflict comes from Dracula's constant need for him, while also belittling him and treating him like, well, a, a servant. Renfield, guilty for his crimes against humanity, tries to find victims that are deserving, at least in his mind, by attending a 12-step help group that discusses their relationship problems with others, and he then finds their abusers and brings them to Dracula. It is supposed to be a direct sequel to the 1931 horror film Dracula, starring Bela Lugosi, where the events that transpire continue here. Much of this film utilizes the beats and notes that one would know about vampires in Dracula, such as his weakness to sunlight, his drinking of blood, his inability to enter a home unless welcomed in, etc., etc. It also focuses almost entirely on Renfield and his servitude and how it affects him. Regardless, while looking for victims, he comes across a bunch of small-time thugs who stole drugs from a crime family, the Lobos. After he deals with them and the Lobos' hitman, he accidentally leaves a trail of evidence pointing to his potential arrest. Smash cut to our secondary character, Rebecca Quincy. Rebecca, played by rapper Aquafina, is a New Orleans cop who's frustrated by the system failing her and how the Lobo crime family got away with the murder of her father. She tries to get her justice, but it always seems like justice is never served. She arrests Teddy Lobo, one of the bosses of the Lobo crime family who was fleeing from Renfield's massacre, only for him to go free j just because. It's a bit of a weird bit because... 
you know, we have this mystery that Rebecca is trying to solve. She's kind of in a bit of the doldrums of her career. She's stuck as a DUI cop. Um, and then she finds this big case. She sees Teddy Lobo, and then it just he seems to be spilling the beans like he's telling everybody, oh, I saw this guy, you know, do all kinds of stuff. He was, like, admitting to all these crimes. And then he just goes free and is flipping off everyone in the precinct. And it's kind of like, oh, we, we were so close to making something interesting, and then we stopped. I don't know. It, to me, that was kind of like a bit of a missed opportunity. Regardless, he goes free, and Rebecca, with her own frustration, does her own investigation. If you can't predict at this point that the police force is corrupt, then perhaps this is a 10 out of 10 film, and you'll just love anything that'll be put in your face. Uh, I, myself, being the pretentious film critic that you see before you, uh, thinks a little silly that they give you even the ounce of assuming that maybe they're not corrupt, that maybe the police force isn't paid off by the Lobos overwhelmingly. I don't know. I, I, whatever. Again, th th things like this are exactly why I'm very lukewarm on the film, because it really just kind of like assumes, okay, whatever, it's a film, let's get the plot going. And this is going to lead up into one of my first big criticisms, but I'll continue on with the rest of my analysis. Anyway, after Dracula gets upset with Renfield for providing him with, quote, corrupted blood and asks him to get pure blood, like nuns or cheerleaders, Renfield is scanning a common stomping ground, which is interrupted by Rebecca and her partner investigating that same bar. Then, the Lobos burst in, guns blazing, only for Renfield to save Rebecca with his superpowers. They meet, and he's just enamored with her. I think it's her courage or whatever, and desire to get justice in an unfair world, which is kind of his aspiration. I'd like to say, probably my first bit of criticism for this film is Rebecca's role in the whole scheme of the things here. You know, we have this whole grand, dark Lord of Darkness... <laughs> Um, plot point going with Renfield kind of coming to terms with basically being the servant and the conduit of one of the most evil men in existence. And then you have this normal cop who's there and she just wants justice on someone that's completely unrelated to anything. Like, I feel like the writers initially wanted this film to just be about Renfield and his troubles. But at some point, someone in the executive branch wanted there to be this romantic situation happening where an honest and normal cop gets embroiled into this narrative. She really doesn't do anything other than drive Renfield to do the right thing, which, at the same time, the help group was trying to do the same thing anyway. I also think that the execs read the script and was like, okay, but how do we appeal to a broader audience? And the usual stereotypical thing is to introduce a love interest. Either that, or the film was struggling to reach its feature length. The film is almost exactly an hour and 30 minutes, the bare minimum for a film to become feature length. If you took out Rebecca, all you have is about an hour of a skittish man gaining and losing and then gaining the confidence to deal with Dracula. Because the comedy flowed decently, I thought it was okay, but when Rebecca was on screen, the main narrative screeched and we had to watch the B-plot. And don't get me started with her sister. As much as I complain, at least Rebecca was a character that had her own desires and reasons to exist, and she had her own plot that made sense in a film. Her sister did nothing other than be a plot device, which did really nothing in the end. We had no idea whether she was corrupt, which she wasn't, and why she existed beyond being a plot point at the end of the film, only to be solved in the most off-camera way possible. Another thing that's weird to me is her name. There's a few characters in Bram Stoker's novel with the name Quincy. Those would be Quincy Harker, the son of Jonathan Harker, and Quincy Morris, one of the vampire hunters alongside Jonathan and Dr. Seward. Maybe they didn't want to make everyone and anyone connected to the previous source material, but then why give her this last name that can be construed as a connection to the previous source material? I found that a lot of this film kind of stood on its own, and it's hard to determine whether it's a completely original idea or a sequel and a continuation of the original story. 
which, according to Wikipedia, is the latter. Which then brings me to my second big thing that's a bit of an issue for me, is that why make this a continuation if you're going to do nothing other than just have Renfield and Dracula as so parts from your source material? Because near the beginning, vampire hunters, who nearly killed Dracula, leading Renfield to move them to, to New Orleans, mentions that they're the last of their kind, and if Renfield stops them, nothing will stop Dracula. But why? Why introduce this film as if it's a part of this continuity, yet doesn't delve into it? Why not introduce this film as a continuation of the events from the 30s film? Why not go through the events of some of the other films, like the 50s, 60s Christopher Lee Dracula films? Or the 90s Gary Oldman Dracula? Why simply quote it, show a couple scenes of them redoing some of the shots from the 30s film, and then dropping it almost entirely? I feel like there's another massive missed opportunity for the introduction. Another thing that I found is that this film lacks any sense of fear or scariness. It is, as I said before, it's said to be a horror film, but nowhere did I get the idea that it was supposed to be one. It's definitely a comedy and a parody of our understanding of what Dracula is, but nowhere is this feeling of something scary that's going to happen. I guess there's a sense that Dracula might take over the world at some point, and there's a scene where he massacres an entire room of people, but beyond that, it's not like it's treated like a fearful thing. Maybe it's because Nicolas Cage plays Dracula, but I think it's more so that the film takes the piss out of everything. Man, everyone just swears at everything and every reaction, and like, most of the comedy just stems from you know, something gory happening and then someone going, oh man, you know, like reacting to that with a swear word. And it's kind of funny, you know, but it's a little pedestrian, you know, for comedy. It's like, yeah, of course, of course, when someone's head flies at you that you knew was alive, yeah, of course that's terrifying. <laughs> but it's like, you know, the guy's in swearing and then he just drives off and runs off and it's like, okay, ha ha ha. I don't know, it, it seems childish to me. The best part of the film, by and large, and this will come to no one's surprise, is Nicolas Cage's role as Dracula. I feel like it was a role he was meant to play for a plethora of reasons. Not only does he pull off the Bela Lugosi look perfectly, but he also pulls off a pretty convincing evil Lord of Darkness. That, and from what I know, Cage's acting is intended to be a style that's inspired from old 1920s German expressionist films like Nosferatu and The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, films that he's gone on to say are massive inspirations to him and his acting. And to have him basically play a character that is exactly from those genres is kind of a treat. That all being said, it's still not as wild this role he's done, as he's only just the main villain that we see every now and then, and we don't really get a ton of him. He's good, and certainly one of the more shiny parts of this film. I will admit that I did like Nicholas Holt's role as Renfield a little better, though. If you ask me, I really don't see how this film's going to be in any way financially successful. Not only just because Nicolas Cage isn't really the financial darling that he had used to be, but also because this film came out around the same time as the Super Mario movie, John Wick 4, and the Dungeons and Dragons film. All films that pull in the same kind of moviegoer like myself, those being man children and other filthy nerds of our similar ilk. So with that being said, I really don't see this film being a financial juggernaut in any way, shape, or form, as it already is shaping up to be a bit of a financial flop. It's a bit too pedestrian and normal to also then become a cult classic in any way, shape, or form. It has a lot of opportunities to become something really fun and really unique, but instead turns it into an empowerment speech about how you're unique, how you're worth it, and how you're so special. I've never heard of a film do anything like that before. Yeah, no, this film is a very hard 5 out of 10 for me. So, with that being said, what movie do I think does vampire parodies justice? Well, if you don't forgot what I said earlier in the episode, we'll see what I'm going to talk about right after this break.
Welcome back. So, as I was saying before the break, Renfield is an overwhelmingly pedestrian and average film that doesn't really give you much to sink your teeth into. It's got some ultra-violence, it's got some of that comedy writing that's very much like, oh, people don't talk like that anymore like they do in the superhero films now. Uh, and it's got Nicolas Cage. That's pretty much all it's got. It's a bit of a missed opportunity that doesn't really give you anything to dive into the world of ancient vampirism. But what film does? Well, kind and generous viewer, let me be the first, or maybe second, or fiftieth, depending on what side of the internet you've been on, to introduce to you the mockumentary What We Do in the Shadows. It's a mockumentary made back in 2014, written and directed by Jermaine Clement, co-creator of cult classic show Flight of the Concords, and Taika Waititi, director of other postmodern comedies like Jojo Rabbit and Thor Ragnarok. It follows a group of vampires from differing time periods who live together in the same house. It tackles all the excitement of vampire life, like deciding who cleans the dishes, who vacuums the house, and who cleans up the sofa after they got blood on it. On paper, it sounds like a downright boring film. And yet, it's a cult classic for a reason. It's one of the funniest films I've ever seen, written brilliantly and utilizing a lot of the stereotypes and tropes that we know about vampires and its ilk. It does a good job of covering the idea of how vampires would exist in our normal world, complete with modern technologies and the norms of society as a whole. Its basic plot is that the four vampires... Viago, Vladislav, Deacon, and Peter all try to live in normal New Zealand. The documentary crew follow them around as they do mundane chores and how they feed on victims, while also going through their own backstories and how they got to know each other. Viago is a 379-year-old fancy pants from the Renaissance era who enjoys classical music and is a bit of a softy and a weakling, despite his monstrous powers. Vladislav, known as Vladislav the Poker, is an 862-year-old parody of Vlad the Impaler, the original source material for Dracula, and is an old-school kind of person who treats torture as a side hobby. Deacon, known as the young rebel of the group, is an 183-year-old peddler whose master is Peter, an 8,000-year-old animalistic creature who's meant to be a parody of Nosferatu's Count Orlok. Deacon has a familiar, Jackie, who works as his servant for eventual exchange of eternal life, and is more or less a parody of Renfield. But weirdly enough, because of this film's mundane nature, it's more like the Renfield in the recent film rather than the Bram Stoker version. Slowly getting tired of working for her vampire master, and just wishes to be done with her chores and getting victims for them. Deacon demands she brings them virgins, as it is the tastiest kind of blood, and after their feeding fails, Peter transforms one of their victims, Nick, into a vampire. Nick is a young hooligan who doesn't really treat the vampirism as the secret society thing that the others do, and instead as a kind of superpower, showing it off to people, which eventually leads to their downfall in some ways. Despite that, his modern take on life and how he views vampirism is refreshing to the Brotherhood, where his tech friend, Stu, introduces the vampires to technology like the internet and such. Again, the more I simply describe the film's plot, the more I probably take away from the film. Its strength doesn't come from the plot itself, it's a pretty mundane plot. But more so, each vampire's nuance takes on the modern world and how their lives have led up to them. It's kind of a thing that if you assume or imagine what a lord from 11th century Romania would act like, you know, you'd think, oh, okay, that's hilarious because that's not what a real person would do. That's thus why it gives it its postmodern identity. If there is one thing Renfield does have over what we do in the shadows, it's its pacing. By and large, Renfield is a film made by a studio for around $65 million, while What We Do in the Shadows is an indie film made by a few guys for just $1.6 million. You can only get so much action with that much money, and Renfield knows the usual tenets of filmmaking. But if anything, it's way too normal of a film, and What We Do in the Shadows uses the documentary-style filmmaking very well, allowing you to listen and read into what their lives are like. 
Despite what we expect, that being vampires being these brooding beings of darkness, living in elaborate castles who control hordes of evil creatures and servants to do their bidding. We see them struggling with the usual rules beset to vampirism, like being unable to enter buildings unless they're welcomed in, or their weakness to silver, or their rivalry with werewolves, who are also parodies of their traditional images, being their own self-help group that try to avoid violence lest they become vicious creatures. It's something that Renfield touches on ever so slightly, but barely scratches. We see a bit of that idea that they can't afford to live in a magnificent castle anymore and instead resort to occupying an abandoned hospital. But beyond that, Dracula's basically Dracula. He's suave, violent, and all powerful, and he intends to be the villain in that film. The vampires and what we do in the shadows are hardly any of these things, and that's where a lot of the humor stems from. Their pedantic arguing feels natural to a group of 100 plus year old people who have to do this every day. Another thing that I lament about Renfield is that despite costing around 50 times more money, it still feels cheap and doesn't provide any more entertainment than what we do in the shadows. Although what we do in the shadows documentary style doesn't make it seem expensive, it doesn't look cheap and their set choices and scenes look natural. In the end, what we do in the shadows has its big climax except instead of it being an action showdown between Dracula and Renfield, it's a showdown between Vladislav and his ex-girlfriend at a monster party, or a monster mash, if you will, where he basically just insults her new boyfriend and then tries to save Stu from being killed, since he's a tech support guy who's also obviously a human virgin. In the end, both films have a happy ending, except one seems earned, with each of the flatmates getting their own small successes, while the other is basically solved because Renfield has a big jug of Dracula's blood, which is used to reverse all the deaths that occurred in the film. So, if you're down for more vampire material, but weren't satisfied with Renfield, What We Do in the Shadows is one of the funniest parodies of what the Lords of Darkness generally are. So, that is all I will tell you for this episode of Hamazitoni. Thank you so much for watching our episode, and I will see you sooner than later. I, I, that's when I'm supposed to put the effect of me transforming into bats, and... Uh, I, mean, I hardly have a budget for this anyway. <laughs>